so what to expect from shell development in the next two to three years? Now, that is a, a bit of a tall order to, to speak on because uh, you know, I, I'm not a, a fortune teller. However, from a, a research perspective, I am fairly well placed to comment as I'm involved with uh, leading the directional BGS shale activities um, to address some of the main science questions regarding shale. And our activities fall into two broad themes. First of all, it's um, the gas resource. How much gas might there be in, uh, in Britain and where it might be? And secondly, the environmental issues. Are, are there any environmental, uh, environmental issues that have a, a geological basis that we can helpfully inform on? And, and on the latter, perhaps it's useful to give an overview of the BGS um, role. As I think over the past few years, it's, um, it's not been particularly clear. Um, I'll start by saying what the Geological Survey is not. We are not a statutory consultee such as the Geological Society. Um, we're not a regulator such as the Environment Agency and we're not a legislator. However, we do work closely with all those organisations and others um, in order to enable those organisations to fulfil their very important roles when it comes to, to shale. So from a research perspective, um, looking at the, the re resource um, first of all, what I'm going to do is I'm going to outline some of the, the ongoing res research that we have and how that might be uh, of interest to the people in the room. And by doing that, um, you'll, you'll get an outline, a hope of what to expect from a research perspective over the next um, few years. So looking at the resource, what are the main things we're trying to do? Well, we're really trying to understand and quantify some of the geological factors that affect the prospectivity of shales in, uh, in Britain. So we're looking at some of the main shale basins. Um, obviously there's the, the Craven Basin in central um, Britain. But I think that the role of the Geological Survey shouldn't just be restricted to the, the main potential horizons. We're also looking at um, the Jurassic Basins, the Wessex and the Weald in the south of, the, the, of England. And we're also looking at some of the more um, sort of left field prospects, so looking at some of the lower Paleozoic, some of the Cambrian shales, so a lot older in the geological sequence. And some of the things we're trying to tease out of these very complicated basins are what might be the variations in organic content and type, um, have a look at how the depositional settings have affected mineralogy, and how they may be controlling some of the, the sweet spots that um, may be pr more prospective than others. So, as well as looking at some of the basins, we also look, uh, have uh, research programmes in place looking at some of um, the processes, the geological processes that have been underway since the rocks were deposited, so what geologists would term diagenesis. So this goes all the way from fracture development and looking at some some of the mineralogical changes that may have happened and again how that may, might impact on the productivity and also some of the uh, environmental issues that, um, that have been raised. And finally looking from the, the resource perspective we have a, a suite of labs at the Geological Survey we're looking at some process um, testing of how gas may be flowing through rocks. Um, now these are very long term experiments um, they may be um, on the go for three to four years, for example. And how are we actually going to communicate this information, this data, to, to you all? Well, there's, there's two main ways that I'm seeing that I would like to uh, fulfill. One is creating data sets of uh, national uh, coverage, looking at element, um, aspects such as total organic content. And the other is, is really I'd like to see a much more of a, a research-driven process from the Geological Survey. So actually getting peer review output and publications. And we've already got several of the studies which are at the writing up stage. And I hope that they will be um, available as peer review publications in the not too distant future. But I think it's important, you know, doing lots of research is, is fine, but why are we doing it? And I think having peer review research, impartial research is, is essential really when we are trying to forward the concept of this, the social licence for companies to operate in the country. So moving on, what else might we find out within the next two to three years? Well, resource is a big 
is a big issue at the moment. So the EIA um, have recently published an assessment of um, worldwide uh, resource for shale gas and oil. Individual companies have recently given us uh, varying estimates of gas in place. And the BGS itself, um, in 2011 we uh, published um, with DEC uh, assessments of recoverable resource um, for uh, parts of the stratigraphy in the country based on a spatial analogy with some of the um, plays in the states. And um, I will mention the, um, the DEC uh, gas in place resource study. Um, this hasn't yet been released um, what it will be is a, a gas in place resource assessment for the Boland Shale and the underlying Hodder mudstone from the central Carboniferous basins of um, of England. And I think it's it's important if I if I outline what the release process will be for that. BGS has a, an impartial remit when uh, we take work from government that we will provide the science behind um, resource estimates. Um, it is not BGS's place to release those figures. That will be handled by DEC. So if anyone's got any questions about the release process, please address them to the DEC press office and, um, and not myself. I think one of the important things over the next two to three years is looking at hazard and risk associated with some shale operations or potential um, hazards and risks. And I think the, um, the Royal Society uh, last year published, and Royal Academy of Engineering published an overview, which is quite useful, outlining some of the, the principal hazards associated, um, that might be associated with hydraulic fracturing, for example. And these included um, fractures allowing the gas to escape, is that a possibility? Um, well completions, surface spills, and I think we can add for the UK to that um, the potential for induced seismicity, as um, research is suggesting that the Bolan Basin may be um, more stressed than similar scenarios in the States. Um, now, a few weeks ago, if I was asked, I'd have said that there's no peer review evidence to suggest that um, activities from hydraulic fracturing at depth could allow gas to migrate and, and pollute aquifers. However, two very recent um, publications um, give some cause for, um, well, they're very interesting, actually. One is um, the from Warner et al., um, and another one which landed in my inbox yesterday, um, has just been released from embargo, is Jackson et al. And this is looking at um, some of the drinking, um, drinking waters from the Marcellus. And it's, the review starts off, some homes located within a, a kilometre of Marcellus gas wells may have drinking water contaminated with stray gases. And it goes on, the, the review goes on to conclude that the chemical signature of the gases in drinking water was characteristic of a Marcellus-like source. Now, I've only seen the, um, the review of that paper, but they, they do indicate that there is, there's further work to be done in the States to quantify the, um, the hazard and, and the risk of that hazard um, being relevant. And I think once we can understand better the situation from the States, we'll be better able to see if that is applicable to the UK or not. Um, work from the Geological Survey is actually looking at some of the, some of the, the hazards and some of the risks and um, some of the outputs from that will be um, published as data sets in the shape of baseline studies of the natural stress regime in the UK and um, there's ongoing work for baseline groundwater geochemistry and also seismicity, natural seismicity studies. So what these do is they, they allow us to understand the natural background geological um, scenarios prior to any um, exploration or production. So they, allow, they give us a yardstick with which to measure any impacts um, that may happen. 
So once we've identified our hazards and we've, we've quantified the risks, and actually it, it's important to, to realise that you know, hazards in general they can't be removed, but risks can be mitigated by regulation. So the, the hazards and the risks feed into to, uh, regulation. I'm not going to mention too much about regulation because it's not my area of expertise. However, research looking at um, water, especially the, the water take for potential uh, fracking operations and the water resource um, disposal options, um, BGS will be involved in advising um, some of the regulators involved with that um, from our extensive um, databases. Um, waste waters and waste materials, um, I think there, are, there is potential there for investigating possibly some novel uses for some of the uh, so-called waste products. But I think it's, it's also um, useful, and I'll, I'll finish on this note, it, it's, it's useful to, to actually have a reality check at this stage as well. So at the moment in, uh, in Britain we've had five dedicated shale wells drilled. Um, there are currently no horizontal wells drilled. As, I'm, as far as I'm aware, there have been no completed fracture programs with flow or production tests. So really the, you know, the, the message is that there is, to inform the debate, there is a need for a lot more exploration, which should be led by companies. And there's also a need for a lot more research. And certainly from a BGS perspective, you know, some areas of research will be taken up um, we'll be doing it in collaboration with academic institutes, with regulators, as I've said, and hopefully we'll be able to inform the de debate over the coming years. So, what to expect from Shell in the next two to three years? Well, I know as, you know, I haven't got the answer, but we will be getting a lot more, um, hopefully, impartial evidence to inform the debate. So, thank you very much. I think the first question that always comes to mind and people ask a lot about is, are all shales the same? Hi, can you hear me on this one? Yeah, good. Um, I think it's fair to say that um, experience from the states indicates that all shales are not the same. However, the preliminary um, results from Rocky Val that the geological survey has undertaken, the depths, the thicknesses of the shales in the UK, are all suggesting that um, UK shells are absolutely not the same, even within the same base, and there are likely to be significant differences. So again, there is a need for a much greater understanding, and some of the work programmes that the Geological Survey is involved with will hopefully quantify what some of those variables are. And as I said, by understanding the, the way the basins have evolved over time, hopefully we can hang on, hang on to those models the results of analysis that will allow us a much better understanding of, of what's controlling the variability. Okay. With that variability, what could surprise us over the next two or three years? What would you look for in terms of surprises? Um, I think one of the big surprises could be um, we have significant thicknesses. We know we have significant thicknesses of shale. <laughs> We know that some areas of those shales are, are looking favourable on the, the TOC. However, some of the maturity um, research that we've carried out is indicating that perhaps significant portions of the shales are possibly haven't, um, won't be productive for gas, but they would be productive for shale oil. So it might completely change the balance of how people are appro approaching the whole situation. Um, a lot of people talk about the Boland Shale, um, and hopefully we'll see the um, report coming out soon. Uh, I believe it's coming out before the summer uh, in government speak, which is good. Um, what other parts of the country and what other shales are there in the UK, and which ones are equally as good or equally as important? Um, well, that's, that's a very good question, because are they equally as good or as important is difficult to quantify when tests haven't been carried out on the rocks. However, initial, the initial understanding is that the productive shales are not just restricted in the Carboniferous to the Boland Shale. Um, there's a significant potential from the shales underlying the, um, the Boland Shale. Um, so those are of um, older age, so-called Visayan um, age. 
There's also potential in for the um, lower part of the Jurassic, um, the Lias, but also the upper part of the Jurassic, the um, Kimbridge clay, which may be more of a, an oil um, prospect. But one of the one of the areas of the UK geology that really interests me is looking at some of the the more left field, as I said, um, potential plays. Looking at some of the Car um, the Cambrian plays, and looking at some of the shales that may be present in what's called the Midlands microcraton, which is a large area of basement material um, underlying um, large areas of central England. And here, they may well be over mature. However, they may well be in excess of four kilometres thick. So I think to try and quantify the potential for those sorts of rocks will be really, really important. I mean, that could be real, a real interest to, um, to, to companies. OK. Um, and we all talk about shale gas, shale oil, but what about other unconventionals in the UK? Um, there is... Um, I mean, it, I think people might have heard yesterday that there is um, active exploration for coal bed methane in parts of the, the UK. Um, there is obviously um, potential for, for tight gas in, in tight sands as well, in, in silts. Um, so, you know, one of the problems I have with the, the term unconventional is that it's, it's sort of just the end of conventional, you know. Just because you drill into a um, a play and don't obtain commercial flows of gas, you know there are technologies out there to make to make that happen. So I think you know treating conventional and unconventional separately is a bit of a you know red herring actually. Uh, and finally, before I turn it over to the audience, is there anything the industry should be doing that they aren't doing now uh, to to look forward into the future? I think if we. If we look at the industry as including operators and regulators and legislators, I think there needs to be much more effort for very clear and simple messages to engage with the public. Um, certainly part of the um, work from the Geological Survey is actually looking at communicating these simple ideas. Because when we have an industry which is, is being linked with um, words such as earthquake, and pollution. I think it's really important to, to allow the public to, to understand exactly what is meant by those. So for example the earthquakes in, in Blackpool from spring 2011 felt by a handful of people have um, no appreciable effect at all on surfaces, you know, buildings or, or whatever. So I think we have to be very careful with the messages that we give and I mean hopefully that will that would be made a lot easier with some of the ongoing research. I know there are um, a few PhD projects, for example, specifically looking at communicating the shale message. Okay, good. Audience, uh, anybody like to ask a question? I've got a mic. Mic? We've got mics? No problem, I'll speak up. Okay. okay. <coughs> One lot of questions actually. I'll, I'll try to keep them brief, two of them more or less together. Uh, Council Government and Wyaborough, and we're next door to. Uh, they keep saying Blackpool, but it was actually in Poulton, the, uh, the seismic event that we had, which is in my borough. Um, compaction on gas extraction, will that have any effect? An expansion? When the fracking liquids are left in there, we heard yesterday that was 80% possibly of the fracking liquids will be left down there. That's, is, that a, is that a concern? Uh, will the variability of the shales uh, result in each individual area being treated separately as a unique, as a, uh, as a unique opportunity? And personally, I'm interested in the Boland shale, the Boland base, and the Boland shales, and. Uh, is there any, any, any chance of shale oil there? You seem to be pointed to uh, clays that would be interested with shale oil. I just wonder if those... Are. Thanks very much if you answer those. OK, well, I'll take those one at a time. Um, ground movements at surface, uh, I'm not aware of any peer-reviewed um, information that would support the transmission of actual ground movements to surface. If there were any at depth, they would be expected to be small. 
and their transmission to surface, I would, I would, I would suggest, would be very unlikely. However, it's um, it is an area for research, and actually, one of the research projects at BGS um, involves looking at some of the fracking sites in the states and using satellite data over time. So, hopefully, I believe there's some issues in Holland with some Okay. Um, and I think your next question was: Is each shale the variability in shale? Will that mean that each one will have to be treated differently? Yeah. Is that right? Um, each operation will be, um, as I understand it, um, each operation will have to put in an environmental impact um, assessment and that will be um, regulated by the um, Environment Agency or, or SEPA in Scotland and it's for them to comment on whether or not they, they think that the proposals will be done in a, a safe and well-regulated manner. Um, however, each shale, as I've already said, each shale probably is different to some degree and you know it's appropriate that they are treated um, one by one. And final, what's your final question on the shale or Yes. Um, well, the Boland Basin um, is, is an extremely large area actually and um, initial um, results from studies that I've been involved in looking at some um, samples from the Boland Basin do indicate that in areas there would be a shale oil rather than a shale gas prospect. Next question. Thank you. Um, John Downer, Penspen. Um, are you aware of uh, the revisions to the U US Geological Survey predictions of gas in place for the Marcella Shale, which, um, according to Bloomberg, were revised downwards uh, in about 2009-2010. It's the size of the revision downwards which was of interest. Uh, the report cited um, a revision downwards of 85%. Do you think we're likely to have some similar shocks in the UK? Um, estimates of of gas resource, of gas in place, are um, notoriously difficult and by their very nature they are estimates mm. and as, you know, as different algorithms are used, as diff more data becomes available, estimates would be expected to change. You know, I would suggest that would be very normal. Um, I, mean, I can't comment on the, the, the methodologies used to come up with the new, or well, the recent Marcellus downgrades, but um, you know, you can already see from the, the company figures that have been released for the UK and um, the um, estimates of um, recoverable resource um, released by Geological Survey in 2011, that you know, there is variability there. So again, better estimates will be um, informed by further uh, subsurface investigation, better understanding of geological logs, of seismic reflection surveys. So as more data comes along, you know, I would expect numbers to change, yeah. And I'll take one more question, I'll take that one over there. Um. Uh, Praveen Martis from Endeavour Energy. Uh, two questions. Um, firstly, the, the DEC report you mentioned for the Boland Basin that, uh, that you're working on at the moment, when do you think that might be uh, released? And uh, secondly, those uh, two papers you mentioned uh, um, looking at the uh, potential uh, uh, seepage into uh, you know, water sources, uh, are they at the peer review stage or have they been published? Um, if so, where do we access those papers? Okay, I'll take the um, easy question first. The um, DEC work, um, as I said just a moment ago, um, I'm not the person to ask about when the figures will be released because that really crosses the boundary from BGS's remit, which is to provide a scientific and robust, defendable methodology to come up with um, reserve, sorry, resource figures. And it, you know, it, it's up to DEC to come up with the release strategy for that because that fits in with their um, policies. 
Could you indicate if, uh, you know, just broadly speaking, are they in line with current uh, estimates or, you know, lower or higher, just very roughly? <laughs> in, um, in common with other commissioned work that the Geological Survey undertakes, it's for the client to disclose. Right. Okay. 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 <laughs> um, the two papers, if anyone needs to um, know more about them, come and see me afterwards, but one is in um, the Warner et al. Is, has been accepted, so it's gone through peer review stage, is um, in applied geochemistry, um, was accepted last month, actually late April. The second one has just been, it's had its embargo lifted, um, and I was notified yesterday, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, and it's at Jackson et al., and I don't know the title actually. I've just got the summary of that. Um, uh, could you uh, could you share what what, uh, what type of uh, gases uh, are they sort of in uh, a greater concentration? Are they hazardous or you know some kind of indication? I think well certainly for the the um, proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, I've only seen the review. I haven't even seen the abstract. So I've just seen a review of the the paper, um, right. a short summary. Um, okay. The um, the other one. Um, I do have the, the whole paper with me today, so maybe we could catch up. Okay, thank you. All right. Ed, thank you. I know there are some more questions. We will have time at the end of this uh, panel. We have about 20 minutes, so I'll come back to the people that had, had questions then. Uh, thank you, Ed.